In Luke chapter 7 here now, Luke records or he begins this chapter 7, this, this area here, and he begins with, a, with an event, an event of faith, a remarkable, noteworthy event that takes place with Jesus. This event deals with a healing that Jesus does for a particular soul, a healing that is totally based on faith. And spaced in faith in this way is so remarkable and noteworthy because this healing for the one comes by a request of one person to some other people for another person. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, third or fourth party healing there. One comes to, the, uh, to Jesus, the ones that come to Jesus, several people, come because of a request by another for a healing for another. It's a remarkable. The presence of Jesus, we will see as we read the story, was not even necessary. His presence of being near that one who be, gets healed, he was not even necessary for him to be there. Jesus never meets this person that gets healed either. Faith alone is the factor. A powerful faith. Belief that Jesus was more than able by the particular one, and then it comes to be. Faith, faith. You know, the title, uh, and, and you see on the, the title of my message, which it'll come up later, don't put it up now, but what is faith? And a lot of us ask that, well, what is faith? You know, the word faith, obviously, is used greatly in the Christian community, right? Within the church, we have faith. You know, we have faith. Well, what really is faith? It's used greatly in the church. It's almost used constantly. Faith, you know, you got to have faith. Sometimes it's, I think, personally, it's used a little lightly with disregard for what faith truly is. A lack of consideration of what faith truly is. You'll say, I have faith. Well, what is faith? We're going to see that. There's some amazing things here. We're going to see about faith. Well, I believe and I trust in God I have faith. I have this mindset. Almost like our faith is used to describe our thoughts towards our God, towards our Savior, right? Our thoughts towards Him. Is faith just a mindset? Is it just something we, we think in our mind, the way we look at something, the way we think, the way what we believe? Is it just a mindset? Is it based upon that? Maybe it's, maybe it's what you've been told. You know, as a long, young child, child, you need to believe. You have to have faith. Right? Maybe you were brought up in a church family. You have to have this faith. And so it's something you've been told or something. Merely a conviction, I again want to say, of the mind. Is that all faith really is? A kind of a mind thing. Well, you know, you, I use this a lot of time, yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Obviously, we have to have a mind of knowing that we believe. Amen. It starts there. It can start there. I believe. I have faith. I trust in my God. I know he exists, and I trust him. But it's really only the beginning of faith and the walk of faith. Faith, faith has legs. Faith has arms. Faith has hands. Faith moves us towards what we believe, too. Amen? Faith has action in it. Faith is much more than just what we think. It's what we do. In chapter 7, as we get into this study, we're going to see here, we're going to see a, a man. Now, this man, by the way, is a Gentile. He's a non-Jew. He's going to be, he's also a uh, centurion, meaning he's a Roman soldier. And this man is going to blow Jesus' mind with his faith. Because he knows what faith is. And we're going to see that this morning. It's going to blow Jesus' mind. Why? Because the actions he took, you know. Guys, turn your Bibles. I know I got you in Luke. Turn to James chapter 2. And anybody knows the book of James? James speaks about this faith, right? What is faith? Faith has feet. Faith has action behind it. He says faith has works. Now, James does not preach a works doctrine, all right? Many thought he was going against the teachings of Paul. No, he just got in perspective what faith really is, a portion of that faith. 
And in chapter 2, verse 14, he writes, What does it profit, my brethren? Now, I always mention this because when he says brethren, he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to believers. He's not just speaking to anybody out there necessarily, although we can take it for everybody. But he says, my brethren, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And he goes, can faith save him? By the way, belief in Jesus Christ, that's what's required, no works. But he's going to go on here, amen? Can faith save him? Well, yeah, it can. But if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit, he says, right? What does it profit? This also, uh, I mean, sorry, says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And he carries on here. It's a dead faith. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, James says. I'll show you that in what I do, the actions I take. You believe that there is one God. This is interesting how he throws this in there. He says, you believe that there is one God. Do you believe there's one God? One God? Amen. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Right? Okay, you have faith in God. You believe. You have a belief. But guess what? Even Satan knows there's God. Even demons know, he says. But do you want to know, oh foolish man? I love it when he puts in there, oh foolish man. Oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. And he gives this example. He says, do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by the works, faith was then made perfect. The word perfect so many times in the Bible, and here also, means mature, right? You become mature in your faith. You start out walking as a baby, or, well, a child, crawling maybe, and then it becomes mature. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then, James says, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Are you saved? Justified, right? That doesn't mean you're saved by your works. He says that the works have to be part of this. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot, if you guys know the story, Harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. And for as the body without the spirit is dead, he says, so faith without works is dead also. Now, like I say, I want to, I want to emphasize this. James is not saying that you are saved by your works. We know that. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by our faith and belief in Jesus Christ. But he is saying that faith will put something into action then. He puts this perspective here that true faith has feet, right? True faith has, has hands. True faith has motion to it. True faith has action to it. You know, I believe I have faith. Now go with that faith and do something with it. Put it into action. Make it more, you know, put it into action what your mouth says. I say I have faith. Well, put it into action. Let me see your faith, he's saying. Blow Jesus' mind, as this particular one does, with the faith. Amen? Let's pray, and we're going to get into this morning's message. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this morning here. I thank you, God, for your word. Your word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Boy, Lord, it pierced, my, it pierced my heart, Lord, as I was studying for this teaching. Father, showing what true faith really is. And so, God, I pray that uh, as we study here, that you just prick all of our hearts with what it is to have faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message is, What is Faith? Question mark. We're going to kind of go through it in this particular uh, narrative here of James as he recorded, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Luke as he recorded. What is faith? Go into chapter 7 now. We spent a little bit of time there, right, in the Sermon on the Plain. Well, I think it was six different teachings. This takes place right after that teaching. 
And it says now then, in chapter 7, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, this particular sermon, he said, he entered Capernaum. And now a certain centurion's servant, a centurion's servant who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he had heard about Jesus, he sent some elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they bade him earnestly, saying that the one from whom he should do this now was deserving. This centurion, this Roman soldier, this Gentile, asked the Jews, asked these Jewish elders, and they said he was deserving. Why? Verse 5, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Now, Luke records this, like I say, it was right after the sermon. The sermon had ended, this sermon on the plain outside of Capernaum. Likely, it was preached pretty near to Capernaum, where that's at. And if you, I should have had a map. Next, I'm going to give you a map sometime up here and show you where the different uh, towns along the Sea of Galilee are. Obviously, most of them are gathered right along the Sea of Galilee because they were fishermen. But he says he goes there to Capernaum. Well, why did Jesus go to Capernaum, right? Well, that's where he resided now. And I'll remember back here how he left Nazareth. They're ready to stone him to death for what he said. And so now he resides in Capernaum. And many people think, believe that he resided with Peter. And in fact, if you ever go to Israel, they've, they have a digging there where they believe this is where Peter's house was. And so whether it is or not, he goes there back to Capernaum to that, because that's where he's kind of living. Um, why did he go there? Well, I probably would think that he needed some shut eye, guys. He needed to go to sleep. Jesus, no doubt, was tired. It had been a long night and a long day, all night and all day. And I'd say he wanted to go home and get some sleep, get some rest, amen. He needed some shut eye. You know, back in chapter 6, if you, if you want to turn there, I'll just kind of mention some stuff, but you don't have to turn there. Jack in chapter 6, we read there where Jesus had been up all night praying. He said he went up on the mountain, prayed all night, and we've seen that in verse 12 of chapter 6. He went up there on the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Then he comes down. His disciples are there in the morning. He selects his disciples and then they goes out, and there's a crowd following him, and he does a bunch of healing and stuff. And then he begins this sermon all night, all day. <laughs> Jesus had been going, man, going. I would say he went there to get some shut-eye. But this shut-eye that he wanted was interrupted. It was interrupted by a request, right? He went there from that sermon, and I'm sure he wanted to go rest, you know, Basically going to maybe tell the disciples even, hey, don't bother me, man. I'm, I'm really exhausted. But all of a sudden, there's this request. He's interrupted by that. People came up and begged him. In verse 4, it says there now, uh, in verse 4, it says that, and when they came to Jesus, these elders of the Jew, they begged him. Please, right? They pleaded with him. They begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving for this centurion, right? And so they begged him there. Think about it. I just think about it. Put yourself in this position. If you were Jesus, all right? Think about this. If you were Jesus, what would you do? Hey, guys, I'm really exhausted. Can you get with me later on this, all right? You know, if you, if you had that phone and there was a, a call coming and you looked at that one and you're just tired and you know the person calling, you don't know exactly what they got to say, would you just push the button, right? If Jesus received that information on the cell, would he go, uh-uh, I'm tired. I'll just click on this, amen? Can I get back to you later? Can I call you later, you know? Would you press the button? Because I'm really, really tired. Maybe we'll get with you tomorrow. Be honest with yourself. Where would you be? You're worn. You're worn out. You've been going. You've been going all day. You know, I don't say this in any pride. I say it in great humility. My phone is on 
24-7. My phone on full ring, as my wife well knows, is sitting right next to my bed. If it's an emergency, two in the morning, emergency, do you know what emergency means, guys? Very, very dire situation. It's there. You call my number, everybody's got my number, right? If it's an emergency. By the way, if it's not something really crucial, please don't contact me after 8 o'clock at night because I go to bed about 8 o'clock at night, right? If you want to send me a text or something, you know, hey, call me in the morning, whatever, you know. But if it's an emergency, let me tell you what, and my wife is witnesses, I'll get my butt out of bed, I'll put on my pants, I'll jump in my car, and I'll be down this hill faster than you ever knew. I'm down this hill one time when the fire department called me about my dear brother Herbie, and they said they didn't know if he was going to make it. I said, I'll be right there. And let me tell you what, 13 minutes later, Drive from Prescott to Will Hoyt in 13 minutes. <laughs> you know, you, you cross all the corners, right? But anyway, be honest with yourself. What would you do? In James 2.15, the reason I mentioned James here, for if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, they come to you, right? There's a dire need. It's an urgency here. The time is of the S, and what do you do? Are you going to help them now? Or are you going to verse 16? And one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Go away, I'm tired. Right? Go away. Go away, I'm tired right now. Depart. De depart from me. By the way, I'll pray for you. I'll just pray for you. Because you know what? I have faith. I have faith everything will be okay. But you don't take care of the need, you see. What do we do? Jesus, man, I'm sure he was tired there. Faith has legs. Faith has feet. Faith has arms. It's got hands. It's got endurance, too. Faith, God's Holy Spirit, faith will give you the endurance and the time you need it. Faith has action, amen, in what you do. I want to make a note here again. In the fact in chapter 7 here, this request, it came by these others. It came by the, the Jews came up to Jesus to request this. And they were making a request for a Gentile, not only just a Gentile, a non-Jew. They were making a request also for a centurion who's a Roman soldier. Amen? So they're making this request. Why did Jesus waste his time on this one? Rome was oppressor of the Jews. He's not a Jesus was a Jew, right? Why would Jesus waste his time on that one out there? Hey, he's just he just a, he's a non-believer by the way. I don't think he was a non-believer. We'll skid into that a little later. But the fact why would he waste his time? After all, he's not part of my church. Huh? Huh? Think about that, guys. What is faith? Faith is we help all. We do good to all, as it says in Galatians. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, it'll be on his screen. As we have opportunity, whatever the opportunity is, let us do good to all. Now, it says, say, especially to the household of faith, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Amen. I say it all the time. You know, with our food pantry, when, when they've got too much of something, I said, you put the best out there for the household of God. Don't be putting the leftovers, all right? We've got too much of something of this. You know, when we get bread every Thursday, I said, if we put bread out on Sunday, I said, it's the bread we picked up Thursday. It's not the bread that was left over from the week before. Amen? And I heard some of you got some moldy bread. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> that white bread. Everybody was getting where they didn't like the... The Dave's bread. It's got the good green in it. Do you like the good bread there, Josh? That's what I thought. Yeah, that stuff's got some. Yeah. Make a sandwich with that. You felt like you ate something. You can take a slice of white bread and you can put it into a little square this big. We used to do that as kids, right? You can press it till there's nothing like this. Pop it in your mouth. I don't know how I got off on that, but anyway. <sighs> Why did Jesus waste his time? 
You know, you're not, you're not my church. Hey, don't you have some place else you can go? Where are we in that too? Where is our faith, church? Is it only for those of the body, you know, of Christ here? Is it only for the people here? Maybe your friends and family that you, you'll go the distance with, you'll go further with? For the believer, for the Christian? So Jesus didn't matter. We're going to see that. They came with a request from a Roman soldier, a centurion here. In verse 3, Read on again. In verse 3, it says, So when he heard about Jesus, when they, he heard, this centurion, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come that he heal his servant. And when they, by the way, servant, slave. The centurion's slave. He wanted them to come heal this one. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one from whom he should do this was Deserving. These Jewish men, these elders, said, hey, this guy is really deserving. Why? For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue here. So these others, again, go on his behalf. And they cared for this guy, right? They cared for this guy. They kind of knew this man, this centurion, though he was a centurion and though he worked for Rome, they kind of knew him to be a good guy. He was a good man. Like I say, he was still a centurion, a Roman soldier. He worked for Rome, and Rome oppressed the Jews heavily. But this one here was different, right? This man was different. He was kind. I'm going to tell you why we can see he was kind. He was humble. They said he was deserving. He had a kindness about him, and he had a humility about him. And he was deserving. And in the eyes of these elders, they, were, they went up to Jesus begging, knowing this who this man, the character this man was, right? He was different than all the other centurions, I guess you'd say. How do we know he was kind? Number one, he making this request for his servant, his slave, his slave. He cared about his slave. Most other centurions, they said, hey, you're dying. Kick him out there, put him to death, finish it off, I'll get me another slave. That was the Roman culture. They don't mess around with no slave, you know? He was kind. He was also humble because he asked these others literally to go to Jesus. The centurion was asking for intercession, right? That they would intercede for him these elders of the Jews would intercede to Jesus. You know, are we ready to intercede? What is our faith? What is faith? Are we ready to intercede for others too? And maybe they're a non-believer. Maybe they're a non-Christian. You know, I've only had once in my life, when I asked somebody, let me pray for you, they said no. Right? One time in 30 years that somebody said no. And she was better. Let me tell you what. She literally said no. Are we ready to intercede for others, you know? What is faith? What is faith? It's that too, interceding for those other ones out there. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Therefore I exhort first of all, that supplication, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for what? All men. Not just as a household of faith, not just your brother, not just your family, not, you know, that one sitting beside you at that time. All men. Intercession, prayer for others. That's part of that faith. What is faith? Interceding for those ones. In Matthew 18, 19, Jesus said, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or more gather, right? Two or more gather in prayer. Tuesday mornings, we gather for prayer. Two or more, we're praying for those prayer cards. Fill up those prayer cards. Come join us for prayer, amen? Jesus calls us to intercession prayer, intercessory prayer for others. Whether they're Gentiles, <laughs> Roman soldiers, 
who they are. Amen? You know, that prayer on Tuesday morning, is high. I want to say it's one of the mainstays of our church, guys, prayer. Jesus says, you know, let my house be a house of prayer. Amen? I love it when I see you stopping and praying with somebody. I see it all the time. You know, one thing about that intercessory prayer, a lot of times, too, is when somebody mentions something to you, pray then. If you've got the opportunity, especially if they're standing next to you and say, hey, can you be praying for me in this? You say, loud, let's pray now, because guess what? In a couple hours, you'll forget about it, right? Somebody calls you on the phone telling you about something. And you, can you be praying for this? Let's pray now. You can pray over the phone. Pray now, guys, because you'll forget about it. And that intercessory prayer is so important. Why did these men, as we read here in this story, why did these men intercede? Intercede for this, this centurion here? Because he built the synagogue, right? Was that the only reason? Because he helped him build the synagogue? Because he was kind to his slave? Did they intercede for that? Because he worked for Rome, and they thought, oh, if we don't intercede for him, maybe he'll come down on us? No. I think it was very evident to these men, and in those times, is what you would call a God fear. You meet people today, they're God fears. Though they don't understand the entire gospel, they are, they, they are a God fear. And I think they recognize him in that. A Gentile who really embraced the God of the Jews. If you read in the book of Acts where Peter went out to Cornelius, Cornelius was also a centurion. Cornelius was a, a, a Gentile. He went to the family there. Cornelius was a God fear and seeking. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't circumcised. See, that's the only thing that made the difference was the circumcision, right? But he feared God. I believe that's what it was with this centurion here. It was not circumcised. You know, Jesus doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the inside. Amen? The heart. This man had a fear of God, and that's why he went to those Jews. I believe he, he understood the God of the Jews, built him a synagogue because of that, did good things. He embraced the God of the Jews. Like I say, Jesus looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the religion either. Religion. You know that word. I was brought up in religion. I really was. I was brought up in the Catholic Church for 17 years till my mom couldn't drag me in, in, in there anymore. I was brought up in religion. I didn't have a relationship with, with my Lord and Savior until I was 33 when God found me. That was a huge difference. And all of a sudden I realized, man, the difference between religion and relationship. Jesus wants a relationship with this church. What is faith? What is faith? We must remember, faith is also that act of the heart in having that relationship, not religion. Not religion. I'm not saying that because you're a denomination, you know, you're Baptist or you're Protestant or you're whatever, even Catholic, that you cannot have that relationship. Check it out, though. Check it. Whether you actually have... a a relationship with Jesus, I don't want you to have a relationship with me. I don't want you to have a relationship with New Day Church, Calvary Chapel, New Day, this building, anything else, those pews. I don't want your relationship with that. Have that relationship with Jesus, amen? That's where it should be. It's not about religion. In Rome, uh, in Romans, Paul writes there, and he speaks about a circumcision of the heart, Right? We all know what circumcision is. Of course, circumcision, the Jews from the Old Testament time we studied on, that was called to be circumcised. But Paul says, hey, a, a true Jew even is circumcised of the heart. In Romans 2.28, for he is not a Jew who is, is one outwardly, right? Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, in the letter of the law, basically, whose praise is not from men, but from God. 
Paul gives this perspective here. There again, in faith. What is faith? It's not on the outside, guys. You know, it's not how you look, how you dress. It's literally on the inside. It's the same for us. Do we have faith? Or literally our faith is seen. It's seen in what we do. It's seen in the way we speak. It's seen in the way we deal with others. However that is, it literally is seen. See, Jesus, that, that, that relationship, again, I, I say, I preach relationship wants a personal relationship with each one of you. you know? My wife loves to use this term, I can't be your Holy Spirit. No, no one can be your Holy Spirit. When your Holy Spirit speaks to you, he speaks to you, right? Don't, don't expect somebody else to be your Holy Spirit. Anyway, that relationship, not religion. In verse 6, we carry on. Now, then Jesus went with them, went with these elders, and when he was already not far from the house, he's pretty close to going to this man's house, right? This centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy. Don't trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy, he says, that you should now enter into my roof, come into my house. He says, therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. This is why I sent these other ones. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. But and then he goes on. He says, for also, he's telling them through these friends, for also, for I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to the other, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. That's a powerful portion in there, and you're going to see why. You're going to see why. What is faith, guys? Again, here we see the centurion. He sends these others, right? we got to wonder why. Why didn't he just, he's almost, Jesus is almost there, almost there to the house, but he sends these friends out. And why does he send these others? I believe there's two reasons, and one's sad. Probably the most important reason for that centurion, he, he felt unworthy. He just not feel worthy. I'm really not worth the bother, right? I'm really not worth the bother to go before, have Jesus come meet with me, Jesus come in my house. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that way? Why would Jesus bother with me? <laughs> Let me tell you what, when God found me 30 years ago, I was blown away. That was seriously, I mean, guys, what an incredible thing, and cried for hours. Why are you bothering with me, right? Oh, man. Hmm. Why should I even pray? Why would Jesus answer my prayer? You know, why? Why? I'm not even worthy. Fact is, guess what, guys? None of us are worthy. <laughs> no, not one. None of us are worthy. Yet Jesus says, I love you. You are my beloved. You are my child. You're my new creation. There's so many beautiful words that Jesus has for you and for me. No, we're not worthy. He loves us. And this man didn't think he was worthy. You know? Second reason, it's interesting. Jesus was a Jew. He was a Gentile. As a Jew, they would not enter a Gentile's house, see? Hmm. They wouldn't enter the home because the home of a Gentile was unclean for a Jew to go into there. This centurion, what faith he had. This centurion was concerned about Jesus and what the light would shine on Jesus. You know, what would be the bad light? If he walked into his house, what would others be saying? He had heard about the ministry. Maybe he was even out there hearing that sermon out there on the plane. And he said, you know what? I don't want to mess up the, the ministry of Jesus. I don't want him coming to my house because I don't know all the Pharisees are going to say stuff. He was worried about Jesus. He didn't want any harm to come to that ministry. That's amazing. God showed me that. He said, you know what? This centurion is a great guy. He's exemplary. He didn't want any harm to come to that. You know, we must also 
We must also, in our walk with the Lord, we must consider Jesus. Don't shed a bad light on Jesus, church. You're a Christian. You're walking as a Christian, amen? Don't shed a bad light. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul writes, For you were once darkness. Amen. Amen. I raise my hand. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Amen? Not to shed a bad light. What is faith? Faith is to walk as a Christian. Right? Walk as a Christian. Live your lifestyle as a Christian. Don't cause harm to Jesus' ministry. It's still going, guys. Jesus' ministry is still going through the church. Don't cause harm to the ministry. You know, I am so firm on that in the fact that I have told people, they get all excited about Jesus. Oh, man, they're Facebooking scriptures and all this. And I know their lifestyle and how they're living. And they're shacking up with some gal, and they're sleeping out of marriage, and they're doing this and they're doing that. And I get a hold of them. I said, would you quit that? Would you quit trying to promote Jesus when your lifestyle is not of Jesus? Because you set a bad light, you see. You set a bad light on Jesus. And I'm sorry if that hurts you. But the fact of the matter, that's true. Jesus just tells us to walk as a Christian, right? Oh, yeah, once you were darkness. But now you're children of light, so walk as children of the light. Amen? And if you're going to have a lifestyle that's contrary to what God tells us to have, I'm not saying we're not all sinners, okay? But if you're going to have a lifestyle contrary, please don't defame my Jesus, right? Don't defame my Jesus. That is taking your God's name in vain. You understand that? Taking his name in vain is not just cursing. Taking his name in vain is saying, hey, I follow Jesus, but my lifestyle, right? Amen. I got a commentary. He writes here, the centurion was a remarkable man. The elder said he was worthy. He said he was not worthy. They praised him for building a house of worship there. He felt unworthy that Jesus would come to his house. He's a remarkable man for this. They said he was deserving. Deserving. He felt undeserving. The writer says, strong faith and great humility are entirely compatible. Strong faith and great humility are entirely compatible. They mold together beautifully. Amen. I have a quote from my good buddy Charles Spurgeon here. He told me this one day when we're... No. <laughs> anyway, you guys know I like his quotes. He says, your faith will not murder your humility. Your humility will not stab at your faith. But the two will go hand in hand to heaven like a brave brother and a fair sister the one bold as a lion and the other meek as a dove. The one rejoicing in Jesus and the other blushing at itself. Blushing at itself. You know, the Bible tells us one day we'll all stand before the Lord and Savior. By the way, when you're standing in that Bema seat of Christ, the, the judgment seat, oh, you're saved. Huh. How are you going to be looking? You know? Will your head be hanging there? Hmm. I love what Spurgeon writes there. Faith and the heart of humility. We see that also in this one. Go on to verse 9 here. Now Jesus heard this. He heard these things and he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, the whole crowd followed he turns around, he hears this and says, I say to you, I have not found such a great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Man, wow. Jesus marveled at the faith. What is faith? He marveled at his faith. And you're going to see several portions of that. That's faith, he goes. Man, I can't believe it. Why did Jesus marvel? Okay, this is a very interesting part. This is very interesting here. He is God, and we are not. Amen? 
He is God. He reigns. He will always reign. Why did Jesus marvel? Go back to verse 8. Go back to verse 8, guys. It says, the centurion says, says, For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, you go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes. I do this, and they do it, right? He says he's got this authority. Jesus marveled here. This centurion, this God-fearer, understood that Jesus had all spiritual authority. I also am a man of authority. You are God. A man of authority, spiritual authority, you see. This centurion, yeah, he was a man of authority. Much as people today, he had power and position in this world. Amen. He had worldly power, but he knew his place. He knew his place. The fact of the matter is Jesus had all spiritual, all spiritual authority, and he knew Jesus' place. What is faith? Knowing our place, church. Knowing our place. Knowing all the authority that Jesus has. That's faith, too. Understanding it is in his authority. He reigns. He is God, and we are not. This centurion, he knew his place, and he knew Jesus' place, you see. You know, why, 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 why do we pray? Think about this. Why do we pray? Why do you pray for somebody else? Why do you seek the Lord on somebody's behalf? Why do we intercede for others to Jesus? Why do you pray for yourself? Because of Jesus' authority. It's his authority. It's his spiritual authority. This is the reason we pray to Jesus. We say, in Jesus' name, it is to the authority of Jesus, 100%. In verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and he turned around and said to the crowd, I say to you, I've not found such a great faith, not even in Israel. Not even there. You know, faith, this faith of knowing his place, faith in knowing Jesus' authority, that's what he's speaking about. To know that the Lord's authority is above all. Amen? We pray in faith. We trust in faith. When you pray, I pray you pray in expectation. Expectation of answered prayer. Amen? We do that. And Jesus answers however he answers, church, in his authority. Amen? That's how he answers, in his authority. Well, you might say, well, I'm not getting any answers to my prayers. I pray, Pastor, and I'm not getting any answers. Who are you? Seriously, who do you think you are? Amen? Who are you? Do you question the authority of the one you pray to? Do you question the authority of God? Who are you? Who am I? God doesn't answer my prayer. Hmm. Do we have the humility of the centurion at all in our lives? You know, God is not a genie in a bottle, guys. You don't sit there and rub the bottle and go, hey, Lord, here, who are you? Who am I? Who do we think we are? Where is our faith? Amen. What is faith? Understanding the authority of God in all ways. You know, I know many that suffer, and I pray for them. Your pastor suffers. And sometimes I'm so hurting, I, God, why? You know, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. As I studied this, you've got to understand, this spoke to me heavily. Who am I to question Jesus' authority in my life? In healing or not healing? In whatever direction? Who am I ever to question that? Amen? Where is our faith? I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And all of chapter 11 is what you call the, we call the hall of faith. It speaks about all the forefathers, all the way back to creation, Cain and Abel, the sons of, of uh, Adam and Eve. And it speaks about this faith, right? And I want to bring you kind of a point in here. We're not going to do the whole chapter. It speaks of all the different patriarchs over the years. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Starts out, and the writer of Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
He says, then, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony, this faith. By the way, the Old Testament saints, how were they saved? By faith. <laughs> how are we saved? By faith. Nothing's really changed, obviously, but still. He says, by faith, first off, he says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God. God created the world. He spoke it into his existence. We understand that. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, then Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And if you read back in the Old Testament, you understand the different sacrifices they gave before God. And of course, Cain killed Abel, right? And he obtained uh, that which was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he's been, uh, he being dead still speaks. In other words, he got killed. But his faith, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him uh, for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, the writer says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Amen. Understanding the authority of God. Without faith... These ones had, knew the authority of God. Their faith, these patriarchs knew God's authority and everything. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God's in control. Amen. Faith is not directing our will. It never will be. It's not directing our will. Faith also, what is faith? It's relying on God's will. God's will for our life. Do I know what is best for this man's life? Do you know what is best for your life? I guarantee you, your Lord and Savior, your God, your Creator does. <laughs> you, know, you might think you know what is best. Yeah, that big house on the hill, a big old garage, park full of toys and that's what's best for me, God. God said, no, you know what? Instead, I'm going to send you down to Will Hoyt, and you're going to be a pastor of a church. And you're going to get a big garage and house on the hill and all those toys. No, you're not going to have that. No, do you know what is best? I guarantee you God does. See, faith, what is faith? Faith is much more than a mindset, guys. You understand where I began this? Faith is much more than a mindset, just a belief in Jesus. It's trusting 100, 110% for the outcome, giving him all the authority, no matter what takes place in our lives. And I understand many times people suffer, many situations. No, we have to trust God for everything, no matter what. We must walk and trust and believe in faith. We must believe in Jesus' authority. I want to read verse 9 again as we finish this up here. I told you we were finishing. You know I'll get there. I got a clock there. I know. I know when to let class out. Bing bong. Uh, I want to read verse 9 here, guys. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled. He marveled at him. And turned around. And he said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, not even amongst all you Jews and all your faith. Wow. You know, I read in there and as I was studying, uh, oh, oh, that Jesus could say that about us, that Jesus could look upon those here and go, oh, I have not seen I have not found such great faith, even in all of Arizona. <laughs> all right? At New Day there, I found this faith. Wow. He could say that about that. Look at their faith. Their faith is moving. Their faith has action. Their faith is caring for others. Their faith is building. They're building my kingdom on this earth. You know, some, some, I got to tell you, there's some pastors out there. They're more concerned about building their kingdom on this earth and not Jesus's kingdom. Amen. They're building that. My children see my authority.
authority too in everything in their lives. I think that's important for us to understand Jesus' authority. They trust my ways. That's faith. No matter what come, right? No matter what come. You know, obviously, we're in a time in our world, in our culture, and things seem really, oh, man, it really is that way, right? Things seem chaotic. Well, guess what? He still reigns. He's still God. He's still in control. The question is, is he in control of you? Do you trust in his authority? Do I trust in his authority? You know, we have to trust in God's authority. My child, think about that. Oh, Jesus just says, wow, I haven't seen anything like that. That's faith because they're trusting in me. They're knowing that God loves them, loves them dearly, amen? They know their eternal promise. In the end, guys, whatever the end is, whatever it is, maybe you die and you go to the grave. Praise Jesus. We're going to praise Jesus. Not because you're gone, Terry, but... Uh, because we know you went to be with the Lord, right? <laughs> uh, if Jesus raptures, we take him, take him. Either way, we're trusting in his authority. Like I say, what is faith? Man, I'll tell you, for those who don't know, it's knowing that God loves you, knowing the eternal promise of God, knowing that all you can really have and all you will ever have is that, that faith in God, to have trust in him. For those who don't know Jesus, you know, John 3, 16 and 17, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. What is faith? Well, it begins there. Really, it does. It begins there in receiving the promise of God. Amen? Everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And for anybody here, maybe, or out online watching our live stream, or maybe on the internet later on, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, number one, I can tell you, by experience, the best thing you'll ever do. And also... It'll be one of the easiest things you ever do. I just want you to pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now and just say, Lord Jesus, I believe. Father, I don't know everything, Lord, but I do know. I do know, Lord, and I believe that you are the Son of God, that Jesus, you came to this earth. You came to this earth as a child, born, grew into a man, you lived a sinless life, Lord Jesus, and then you died. You were sacrificed upon a cross for my sins, Lord. That, Lord, after that, they buried you in a tomb, and three days later, you rose again, according to the Scriptures, Lord. Father, that's where my faith is going to start. Lord Jesus, receive me. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer this morning, hallelujah. Uh, and there'll be some people up front here afterwards for any prayers. But if you want to, if you receive Jesus for the first time, please come forward and we'll encourage you. If you're out online and you receive Jesus, there in your living room, right? Uh, find a good Bible teaching church, right? Learn what it is. Learn what it is to walk with with God and, and grow, grow in the grace of Jesus and grow in the knowledge too. The Bible says grow in the knowledge, amen? Well, let's uh, pray and if you want to stand up, we have a last song here this morning, just uh, praising our God and who he is. Father God, we just thank you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for this time together as we came together, Father, and I pray, God, that uh, we will always remember, Lord, that uh, Part of our faith is trusting in you and trusting in your authority, Lord, and your will. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.